speaking from the book of Mark. I've been reading through the book of Mark recently, but I um, haven't been getting very far because I can't seem to get past chapter 5. And I'm not quite sure why God is keeping me there. But when I started reading this chapter, I just felt a preach leap out of me. And it's probably been the easiest preach that I've written because it just flowed and flowed and flowed. So I'm just believing that God is going to speak to each of us through this passage today because it gives us all sorts of truths and lessons that we can kind of learn from it. And I've come to utterly love this passage. I probably almost know it off by heart and I hope that you'll come to appreciate it too. And really this passage is all about faith. It's all about faith in Jesus and having that confidence and that assurance and hope for what we do not yet see. Okay, but I think we should pray and then I'm going to read that passage to us. So Father, I just thank you that we are in your house. I thank you that we stand here on holy ground. I thank you that this is all about you, God, and it's all about glorifying who you are. So we just ask again that your presence would be here, that your spirit would move among us, God. Open our hearts, open our eyes. Speak to us, God, I pray, because that's why we're here. We want to hear your voice. In your precious name, God, amen. So I'm going to read from Mark chapter 5, and it's starting at verse 21 to the end. And it says, When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She'd suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. Because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was free from her suffering. At once Jesus realised that power had gone from him and he turned around in the crowd and he asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and he said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said, (coughs) Talitha Kuem, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this they were completely astonished and he gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this. And he told them to give her something to eat. So Jesus has already had a full day in ministry. Earlier in that chapter, we see the account of how Jesus has cast out a legion of impure spirits from a poor man into a herd of pigs. So, you know, it's quite a day, isn't it? If we'd had that day, we'd probably be going home for a light now. But... Then he has this boat journey across the lake, and when he arrives, this is where we pick up our passage. Immediately, as his feet touch the shore, the crowd is there, they're on it. Jesus attracts the crowd, because they know that he has something that they need. Within that crowd is a man named Jairus, he's a synagogue leader, he's a religious man. But unlike some of the other religious leaders of the day, he's a man that understands who Jesus is. And for his own situation, he knows that Jesus is the only hope, the only answer, and he's seeking Jesus first. You see, Jairus is facing the worst 
situation ever known to a parent. His daughter is at home and she's dying. Jairus is desperate. You can imagine that feeling if you're a parent. And I'm sure doctors have already been consulted and remedies used to reveal this girl of her illness, but to no avail. And verse 22 and 23 of Mark just gives us a glimpse of just how desperate Jairus is. And it says, when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. My little daughter is dying. Just imagine the emotion in his voice, that fear and dread as he spoke those words out. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. There's so much in just that verse alone. Sometimes we read scripture too quickly and we just miss the gold that's in a few lines. Jairus falls at Jesus' feet. He's humble. He's surrendered. He recognises Jesus' authority and his action right there gives us a perfect example of how to be when we come and make our requests to God. Humble, surrendered, aware of who God is, aware of that it's just a privilege to be in his presence. Jairus knows what he needs. He tells Jesus the problem and then he utters a prophetic statement. He says, if you, Jesus, come and put your hands on her, then I prophesy that she will live. Just one touch, Jesus, that's all I'm asking for. One touch. I'm not asking for a meeting. I'm not asking for a conference. I'm asking for one touch. One moment in your presence, and it's going to be life-changing. It's simply Jesus in our situation. And Jairus' words here have everything to do with this passage. Words. What words do we speak? Are we being prophetic and expectant with our words? Are we believing that God Almighty is well able and capable and hoping for the outcome that we don't yet see? Or do we kind of go on the side of caution, not wanting to get our hopes up and, and put our trust in things of man or kind of whatever will be, will be? And Jesus responds to Jairus again in a simple, straightforward response of action. Nothing is recorded to suggest that Jesus had a conversation with him, but verse 24 simply says, so Jesus went with him. You know, I want to be Jairus in that moment because I want Jesus going with me. You know, we had our prayer for healing day on Good Friday, and maybe on the surface we didn't have as many new people in that we'd hoped for. But for me, that day was just a massive victory in my life because I made a choice to go out on the streets and share Jesus with Harry first and then later in the afternoon with Joe. And you know, I'm going to be honest, I would much rather be inside Hope Central. I would much rather others came into my territory where I feel comfortable, you know, my comfort zone. But Harry kind of suggested that I join him and Kind of in that moment, time stood still, and I had this internal panic. <laughs> but, you know, I knew God was saying, well, will you? You know, it wasn't Harry inviting me anymore, it was God. And everything in me wanted to say no, but I ignored myself. And before I knew it against my will, I had agreed. <laughs> you know, and it was massive for me. We shared Jesus, we prayed with people, we gave our invites to hope, and we placed a seed with great potential to point people to Jesus. And for me, it was an act of obedience, and in that pretty scary situation, I was not going to go and do that without Jesus being with me. Satan, he wants to keep us contained so that we cannot have that impact on others. Jesus says, go, and I'll be with you, so that many may see the greatness of our God, whether through miracles like we're going to see in this chapter, or simply by making ourselves available to others, like people that day on the the streets of Galashiels, or every time our amazing Hope Central team open the doors and welcome people in, every time Wilma and Maria sat with Lorraine, it's the same willingness, the same thing. And Jesus is there with you, whatever it is you're doing. And as Jairus walks towards his dying daughter, he makes sure that... He has what he came to the the lake for, Jesus. He's not leaving without him. And I believe that Jairus strode off that day with great faith and expectancy, a longing for what was to come. Faith, being certain of what we do not see. And throughout the Gospels, we know that there has to be faith in the environment for Jesus to heal. 
Did Jairus' daughter have faith? Probably not. She was probably way too ill. She was probably unconscious, if not already dead. But it's a lovely, powerful picture of standing in the gap for someone. Jairus has a faith-filled heart for his daughter, which sets the scene for what's about to happen. And I love how Jairus is humble before Jesus. He's respectful, but yet he's not afraid to ask. He comes boldly before the Son of God. He gets his attention and he tells him what he needs. This is what it says in Hebrews 4.16. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We need to approach God so that we can ask in our time of need and receive his mercy and grace. Jairus approached God. The woman with the issue of blood approaches God. Are we approaching God boldly, unapologetically, yet with reverence? And Jesus and Jairus go on their journey, and it's not going to be a straightforward journey. The crowd is all around them. It's pressing in. You know, it's hard to walk through a crowd. You'll have experienced that. I have at Selkirk Common Riding or Princess Street in Edinburgh at Christmas time when it's, you know, really busy, and it's hard to make progress. My children have taught me a skill in such situations, and it's called weave. I don't know if you've heard of this skill. And it's been tactical and purposeful at quickly getting through a crowd. So you're looking ahead for a path through all these people and you're constantly picking out this route and it works. You make great progress. But somehow I don't think Jesus was too worried about weaving, but I wonder if Jairus was. The situation was critical. His daughter is hanging on to life and every moment matters. And then the unthinkable happens for Jairus. The most important journey that he'll ever make is interrupted. And a delay is caused as we see yet another example of someone else coming to God with expectancy and faith and a knowing that he is the only answer to a desperate situation. And it says, a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She'd suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all that she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. Before she thought, if I just touch his, sorry, because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. Do you see how, like Jairus, she also speaks from a prophetic stance? If I just touch his clothes, then I will get well. If, it was a big if, because the crowd was big. She was weak, she was ill, but yet her determination to get to Jesus overtook her lack. And this woman weaved her way like never before through this crowd, and you can just imagine her catching sight of Jesus and just being so close, and then just going for it with a last burst of energy that she didn't even know she had. And she reaches out. And she touches his cloak. What a moment. She makes contact with the miracle maker. And in a moment, her 12-year battle with sickness is gone. And finally, she is free. And this woman understands the importance of getting close to Jesus. She knows she won't get healed from a distance. And she presses in. She's practical about this. And she's determined. And I think, you know, if she had missed Jesus that day, she would have gone back the next day and the next day and the next day until she could just grab that cloak. What else did she have? She had two options. She had death or she had Jesus. How close are you getting to Jesus? Are you the one that would kind of stand back, be on the fringes of the crowd? You know, if you were there that day, you wouldn't want to be a bother to Jesus. He's clearly on a very important mission with Jairus. Why would he bother with me? You know, Jesus came to this world to be bothered by you. To be bothered by you and by me. And I hope that you understand that. Because if we don't understand that, then we are in danger of setting our thoughts and our ways higher than God's ways. Which isn't going to be good. For anybody. Mark 2.17, this is Jesus speaking. He said that it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Jesus wants to be bothered, and that's why he came. And I think this woman had had a revelation of this because 
even though there was a sense of fear that she would be so forward that she would not even ask his permission to touch him. But she sees her chance and she grabs him. She's bold in her actions. She's like Jairus, who lives that verse from Hebrews, coming boldly before the throne. And what an astonishing event when she knew in that moment that she'd been healed. But this relief was quickly replaced temporarily with probably a huge rush of panic as Jesus addresses the crowd and says, who touched me? You know, what a crazy question because there's so many people there. But he's saying, who touched me? Who touched me intentionally? And as the woman confesses to Jesus what she's done, notice again her stance. She's humble. She's surrendered. She's trembling with fear because she is aware that she addresses the Son of God. Yet Jesus doesn't use this scenario as an opportunity to show control or, or anger, but he loves her. And I think he, he delights in what she's done. He loves her level of faith. And this is a reminder to us that we don't need to wait for an invitation from God. We don't need to go through someone else to access God. But God says, draw near to me. You draw near to me. Some action is needed. And I, God, will draw near to you. And look how Jesus then responds to her. He says, daughter. I love that he calls her daughter. He could have said woman. He often did use that term. But he uses this intimate family term and addresses her as daughter. Someone who belongs. Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. And I love that he says, go in peace. It's almost like he's saying, you know, this healing isn't a one-off wonder. This is with you for the rest of your life. You don't need to worry, but live in peace and walk in your freedom from suffering. And it's just a beautiful moment. And then we see this huge contrast. The atmosphere must have changed and along come the cynics, the doubters, the troublemakers. Verse 35, some people came from the house of Jairus. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Your daughter is dead. I mean, it's pretty blunt, isn't it? They're telling Jairus to stop making a fuss and not to waste the time of Jesus. In what they've just expressed, they've actually attempted to limit God's power. They're challenging God's power. These people are probably controllers, they're probably a bit negative, they're probably kind of the glass is half empty kind of people, and they're unwilling in this moment to believe in the supernatural. You know, our culture today is full of these people. Every day, our culture is challenging the power of God, the word of God. Our culture today is trying to rewrite and redefine what God has ordained. Are you aware of that? And this statement that the people are declaring in this passage, your daughter's dead, don't bother Jesus, it's Satan. He wants to kill the potential in this situation with Jairus and Jesus. It's a totally different situation to gender, but the same spirit is behind it. Culture would say, don't go with God's understanding, but go with your human understanding. The girl is dead. It must be final. He wanted to destroy every bit of faith that Jairus had and hijack the situation, turning it from hope to despair. Satan is bringing trouble and doubt as this journey with Jesus and Jairus takes place. Where is Satan bringing you trouble and doubt? And what is he trying to destroy in your life? What potential is he trying to crush in you? If you have trouble and anxiety in your life, you can almost certainly trace that back to him. How does Jesus respond to this negative voice? Well, he doesn't actually. He, he totally blanks them. He doesn't engage with them. He doesn't want to waste his time on them. And you might find that a bit harsh. But Jesus will not be derailed when he is on his father's business. He knows what spirit is behind it. He's not going to waste his time. He simply and with clarity, he addresses Jairus. This is what he says. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, Jairus. Keep it together. Just believe. Luke 8 verse 50, the same, the same account. 
Don't be afraid. Just believe and she will be healed. You know, you couldn't get much clearer, simple, straightforward instruction from the heart of God. Don't be fearful. Just believe. Eyes on me and watch the miracle happen. And these accounts stir faith in us, don't they? And we read these passages. But what are we to do when we have faith and we believe and we cry out to God and it seems like nothing is happening? A couple of weeks ago, Michael and I went to visit his parents. Many of you will know them, Barbara and Andy. And they're currently caring for her brother, David, who has suffered two, two, three strokes and... At the moment, he's paralysed down one side. And this situation has actually gone on for approaching 18 months now. And we want to see an end to this. We went with great faith and expectancy to pray for Dave and to see him healed. We had an amazing time of prayer together. And we actually read from this same passage. And, you know, I was crying and it was just a mess. And the presence of God was really tangible and we were just convinced the four of us and Dave five of us as we prayed that he was going to rise up out of that wheelchair as we prayed we were like we so believe this we are so expectant for this and I don't understand that when he, he didn't but I know that God is sovereign and God never tells us that we'll understand everything but he calls us to remain faithful Many people have prayed for Dave over that time, you know, giants in the faith, faithful people, and you know, there's faith everywhere, and yet we are still to see his healing. I don't understand. I wish it was quicker. I want to see my wonderful in-laws released from their 24-7 serving, but you know, it hasn't happened yet. Our response? Don't be afraid. Just believe. Eyes on Jesus, press into Jesus, and we pray and we pray, and we pray. Our job is to believe, to keep asking. God takes care of the response, and and we have to trust him with that. And even though we didn't see the outcome that we had hoped for at the time, you know, it was still such a precious time together because Jesus went with us. And I don't know what situation you might be facing today, what giant, what mountain, what worry, what circumstance. Don't be afraid. There's nothing to fear. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Take him with you every day. Don't forget whose you are. He calls you daughter. He calls you son. He knows all about it. Don't engage too much with people who want to speak doubt and reason into your situation. You know, God's above reason and human understanding. When did we ever limit his power to that? And then Jesus does respond to the doubters, not in words, but this. Verse 37, he did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, his disciples, people on the same page as him. You can just imagine Jesus hearing those negative comments and just kind of shaking his head and saying enough of those voices declaring she's already dead, don't bother him. Enough of God's power being challenged. He doesn't waste his time arguing with these people, but he just cuts them out of something much bigger than themselves. They don't get to witness and see what's about to happen because they they didn't get to go with Jesus. It was their choice. Is it a picture of eternity when people fight and fight against God and then the end comes like a thief in the night and suddenly the door to eternity in heaven is shut And those against him are not invited in. Pause for a moment and ask yourself, who's in my life? Don't take the doubters with you. Don't take the negative ones, the stirrers, those people that that you come away from feeling discouraged, those that plant disunity. It's not going to build you up. The longer we spend with people like that, the more we risk becoming like them. And I'm not saying cut people out at all, but I'm saying be wise. Those who refuse to listen, those relationships that suck the life out of you, those that just want an argument, be wise how much time you invest. 1 Corinthians 15, 33 says, Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Take Jesus with you. Surround yourself with faithful friends and make sure you don't miss the journey and the the miracle that is at the end of that. Also have a look at yourself. Where do we stand? 
What comes out of my mouth? Are we speaking life? What's in my heart? If Jesus was here today in the flesh and there was a miracle mission to go on, would he be picking you and me out of the crowd to go with him? And this adventure in Mark continues. Jesus, Jairus and the disciples, they arrive at the house and before they even see the house, they can hear a commotion. The wake is already happening and there's crying and there's wailing and the atmosphere is thick with despair. But God, God enters the storm and now it's Jesus' turn to prophesy. And in the face of despair, he challenges those that are challenging him. And with authority, he states, the child is not dead, but she is asleep. And all these people who were wailing and crying are now laughing. And they're laughing at the words of Jesus. They're laughing in the face of Jesus. And Satan, who still wants to derail what is about to happen, has this last stab attempt. And he uses laughter to intimidate, hoping for doubt to increase, increase, and faith to decrease. And again, look at his response. He's not wasting his time in getting into a discussion, trying to win them over, but he just takes control of the situation. He says no in the face of intimidation. And it says in verse 40 that he put them all out. I mean, imagine being sent out by Jesus. I can still imagine and remember being sent out of a class when I was at school and the fear and how I felt. Imagine Jesus sending you out. Jesus removes the problem and so it is with us. We're either with Jesus or we're not. We're either in his presence or we're not. Where do you stand today? Jairus was in his presence. The doubters, the intimidators, the one who did not believe were not. It's culture again, isn't it? Laughing in the face of Jesus when society challenges what the Bible says. And then Jesus walks into the centre of this scene where the dead girl is and without any doubt present, no fear, no uncertainty, no intimidation, he speaks. He speaks life, he speaks restoration, he speaks healing and he speaks strength. He speaks peace and he speaks calm, just in the nature of who he is, in the fact that he's there just in his presence. You see, that's why you want to be in his presence. That's why you always want to take Jesus with you, despite the interruptions of life. That's why you want to make sure that he is at your centre, because Jesus speaks these things to you that I've just listed in your every day by the very nature of who he is. And on this particular day, this particular moment, Jesus speaks to the dead girl. And he says, Talitha Kuem, little girl, I say to you, get up. The version in Luke chapter 8 says, my child, get up. Jesus is so personal, my child, it's beautiful. It's God's expression of how much he wants you to be his to belong, to be found. It's the same power that he ushered in when he said to the woman who touched him, daughter, your faith has healed you. His power that amazes people, that astonishes people, that wakes people up to their need of him. This power that takes out demonic forces, that silences the doubter, that silences the negative words, that silences the intimidator. The people in this room that day, it says, were completely astonished. The girl's parents, the disciples, what an amazing day that must have been in that room as it was filled with the mighty presence of God, as victory came, as they literally saw firsthand the power in the name of Jesus where grief turns to joy. Are we positioning ourselves to be astonished? Are we keeping our hearts right, pure, loving, kind, that we might walk in step with the Father, that Jesus would come with me, that Jesus would come with you? Are we seeking him first in all that we do? Is the presence of God apparent when we speak? Don't worry about that. The walls of Jericho are coming down. They've got trumpets. I'll just speak louder. Yeah, are we seeking him first in all that we do? Is the presence of God apparent when we speak? 
Are we gentle? Do we prefer others to ourselves? Or are we kind of angry and agitated and offended with life? And I find it interesting that this chapter ends and Mark chapter 6 opens with an account of Jesus going back to his hometown. He's teaching in the synagogue and it says that they were amazed, the people that were listening to him. They were positioning themselves to, to be astonished and witness great wonders. But unfortunately for them and a consequence for many sick people that day, they didn't stay in that place of astonishment, but they got derailed. Instead of understanding God's heart, they decided to question and they reasoned and they doubted and they caused themselves to be offended. The consequence of their offence, the consequence of your offence, of my offence, Mark 6, verse 5. He, Jesus, could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. Now it's Jesus' turn to be amazed, and it's not in a good way. He's amazed that their level of offence is such that it topples faith, and he could not do many miracles. It's a high price to pay. How we position ourselves is so important. We're doing a series at Hope Women at the moment called She Wears. We only want to wear the characteristics that God has for us. And it comes down to this one thing. Are we seeking God first? That's what it's all about. We're either seeking God first and walking in step with him, we're the believers, or we're seeking ourselves first and we're walking in step with ourselves, we're the doubters. Are you a believer today or are you a doubter? Are you like Jairus, surrendered and placing your hope in Jesus? Are you like the woman who was sick and did everything she could to get to Jesus and touch him? Or are you like the crowd? Do you listen to reason? Do you look for an alternative to the supernatural and allow doubt just to settle? Wherever you are, it's okay. We can change course today. We can get back on track and every one of us in this room can leave today as a believer. And I want to end with this one standout truth from this passage. And it's simply this, that Jesus attracts a crowd, yet he has time for the one. Jesus left the crowd because he had compassion on Jairus, the one. Jesus allowed the journey to be interrupted for the woman who was bleeding because he had time for the one. And today, Jesus notices you. Whether you're a a Christian, you've been a Christian for many years, but you've maybe turned and got a bit of an edge and you're just kind of doubting a bit. You've become negative over these last years and you've kind of lost your first love. Jesus notices you. Or maybe you've never made a decision to invite Jesus Christ to be your saviour. Jesus notices you today and today could be the day that you rewrite your story. When you ask him to become your personal saviour, you ask him to forgive you of your sin and make a transition from a doubter to a believer. Jesus notices you. And that's because Jesus is so personal. And Jesus wants nothing more than a personal relationship with you, a relationship that changes everything. Or maybe you're sitting here today and you've got sickness in your body. You're not well. Jesus notices you. Maybe you need someone today to stand with you and believe with you and pray with you and call out to the miracle maker. Jesus notices you. And you know, I'm going to invite the band to come up and I just want to invite that invitation to you. Jesus notices you. And I want to say that we would so love to pray with anyone who either wants to recommit their life to Christ today, who wants to make a first-time decision for Christ, who is not well and wants us to stand with you and pray in faith for your healing, just like we read in that chapter. And we're going to respond, we're going to sing the first song, and then during that second song, it's called Come to the Altar. Just come, come to the altar. And we're just going to make room to pray with you guys up front. You know, don't hold back. Let's be like that woman who just gave her last 
last drop of energy to get to Jesus. She, she wasn't intimidated by the crowd. You know, when Jesus stopped everything and said, he touched me, how embarrassing could that have been for her as everyone probably glared at her? You know, she's, she's interrupting this journey for Jairus. But no, she knew she had to get to that prize no matter what. So just you come down during that second song and our prayer team will be on the left here and we will facilitate that for you. But let's, let's stand, we're going to sing and I'm just going to pray as we do that.